it is time to begin. And I see we still have a few people rolling in, so we'll continue to admit those, but we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we're excited to have you joining us for the Rural Life Virtual Summer Institute today. Uh, welcome to Pedagogy and Classroom Management in the Online Environment. My name is Brooke Drennan, and I'm your session host. I'm here to support the presenter, uh, who I'll introduce shortly and offer technical assistance to, to you participants, as well as share the session evaluation and, and certificate information at the end of the session. So please don't hesitate to use the chat to ask questions or, or technical support. Um, now, there are a few features of Zoom that I'd like to run over just really quickly with you. Uh, just in case you're new to Zoom, uh, I'm sure that most of us are pretty experienced at this point. Um, as I mentioned just a little bit earlier, we would appreciate if you keep yourself on mute just so that um, we, can, we can all hear. Um, and the mute button is down in the, in the bottom left-hand corner of your Zoom screen. You'll see a little microphone there. And um, also, if you'd love to show your face, uh, we'd really appreciate that just to be able to see everyone. So there's a, a start and stop video button right beside of the microphone in the bottom uh, left hand corner. Uh, you'll find the chat box right in the middle. It's a little like a dialogue bubble there in the middle. So just use that if you need to communicate, if you have any questions or if you're having any problems, uh, we'll try to help you out right away. And um, now I'd like to introduce to you your session presenter, um, Gina Pavlovich, and she is the director of Nyswanger Foundation's online learning. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brooke. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm Gina. I'm the director of Nyswanger Online. I have uh, worked with Nyswanger for um, almost a decade now, and I've been the director of the online program for five years. Um, I have, uh, I used to teach at Greenville High School. I'm a high school social studies teacher, and in the online world, I'm still a high school social studies teacher, and I will, I teach um, various online courses, uh, personal finance, econ, history, um, things like that with the Nyswanger program. And, uh, <clears throat> What I want to do, and if uh, just to talk about the materials here, you can find this um, this presentation online in the uh, materials section, and you can also I'm going to be showing you a website that I've created that has some resources on it to help you as you're um, as you're thinking about online online teaching and learning in the future, and you can find a link to that website within this, um, this Google slide deck, but then also you can find it here um, when you go to view the materials for this session. And if any of you have any trouble finding that, let us know and we'll, we'll even send direct links to you through the chat box if you want to pull all of this up right now. Um, I wanna start by saying that we only have an hour and I'm going to talk really fast and I'm going to click through some of our online courses to try to show you some things. But um, really, you're not going to leave this hour long session knowing everything there is to know about about online learning and and all and classroom management in the online world but what I am hoping to do is one to just put some ideas in your head. And, and as you think of your own classroom and you think of possible um, projects or assignments or resources that you want to put online for your students to access, I hope that this gives you some ideas and some things to think about as you're doing that. And um, I hope that it also, the website that, and I'll click right here, I'll click on it, um, but I'm hoping that this website will also help give you some resources and just help you learn a little bit more uh, and just kind of give you that foundation of what you should be thinking of always when you are putting information and putting assignments online. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and click this and just pull up this website and show you a few, um, a few things that you can find here. So the first page that's going to come up is um, the uh, the page that is with this that I've created for this session. However, if you look here, you can see um, 
every session that I'm doing throughout these few weeks, I've created a page for it. And what I've done is I've put videos, I've put information articles, I've put links to um, infographics and things like that that we use in Nicewanger Online, all just to kind of help give you an idea of things that you can create, things that you can do um, within your own classroom. Um, just on this page here, if you scroll down this, so here's the presentation I'm going through right now. Once the video is uploaded to YouTube, uh, this webinar, I will add it here so you can always go back to it easily. Um, but these are things that I'm going to talk about today. So, so when I tell you to kind of sit back and relax and don't stress, um, I, I'm saying that because everything that I'm getting ready to cover, you can come back to this website and, and you can find it at a later time. So when you are deep within your online class and you're creating an assignment or you're trying to create um, rules and norms for the, for the online environment, when you're doing all of that, you can come back to this website and, and look at this information and just hopefully, again, help you get, uh, I hope it helps give you ideas for your own um, class. And I do want to show you, um, if you, some of you may have been with me with the other uh, sessions that I had, but if not, if your school system is getting Canvas and, and you're newer to Canvas, I have a whole page that is full of videos on how to do things within Canvas, how to make a home page, how to create assignments, how to copy one Canvas course to another, um, outside resources, how do you see what your students see, just full of, uh, full of videos. And then this one is also full of ideas for free online programs. So, um, you can see, and I'm going to talk during this presentation about a screen recorder. I think the first thing that every teacher needs who's going to do any kind of online um, presence within their classroom, the teacher needs to get a free screen recorder. And this one here talks about one that I use that's called Screencast-O-Matic. And I'm actually gonna show you some examples uh, in a moment from where I used it. But um, there's videos on that. There's videos on how you can create a free Canvas account right now and start creating work. And then if your school system gets Canvas and, and hands you a blank shell in the fall, I show you how to take what you've created this summer and put it into your school's Canvas account. And then this one is just full of different ideas uh, and different websites that teachers and students can go to to, um, to create information. So please um, check all of that out. And again, just remember that don't make this face when I'm talking because I promise that uh, everything that I'm getting ready to say you can find on that website and you can come back to later. So um, I always, I'm going to tell you over and over, and we all know this anyway from our classroom, but you always need to stress the why, like why are we here, why are we doing this? And so I wanted to start with you guys with with the why and why are why are you here? Why are you doing this? And I also want to stress that even without school closures because of COVID-19, creating a remote or a blended learning environment for your students is just a great thing that you're going to be able to use no matter what. So well, five years from now, when no, you know, students are like, what what's COVID-19 they don't even remember this has happened you're going to be able to still use things that you've created during this time period within your classroom to help you and to also help your students and I just put a few bullets here of ways that I've used it in the past um, it's a great place for you to have sub plans and you know it's, it's Sunday not at eight o'clock and, and you just left urgent care and your son has has strep throat, well, you know you're not going to school tomorrow and, and you're thinking, man, I, I've got to call my friend who teaches across the hall and I got to ask her to go make a hundred copies of something. Well, no, you don't. You can just have everything online and introduce your students to this online presence, but you can have everything there waiting. And, and then all you do is, is you just tell the sub, tell the kids to log into the online classroom and go to the module that says this. And then you have all of the work there that 
and, and the students are ready to go and and they don't just have to stop learning. You don't just have to throw in some video that you don't think is that useful, but you don't have anything else to do. So it's a great place to put sub plans. Um, it's a great place to personalize work and have different modules and students can do different modules at, on their own pace at their own time. It can be enrichment, it can be review, it can be re remedial, but it's all there. And you can even assign certain modules to certain kids. And so you tell the kids, open up, go to the online class, and what's showing there for Sarah could be totally different than what's showing from John in his online class because they need to work on different things, but they won't even really know it because you just have it there automatically set up for them. Um, I've always, uh, when, when I taught, gosh, how long ago? I mean, early in my teaching days when we had one laptop cart at Greenville and we were super excited about that one cart, um, I was pulling it into my classroom like once a week just and having students um, divide up into groups and some would be working on laptops and some would be doing work from their book and some would be sitting in front of me just talking with me. And that was the biggest reason for doing that was because I, as a social studies teacher, I would have 35 students in a classroom and I needed to divide those students up and be able to talk to them more in a one-to-one -one or as close to one-to-one -one situation as I could get. And so um, that was some of the best uh, teaching time for me was when I had that small group of just 10 kids in front of me and I could sit and look them in the eye and talk to them. Um, and it's just in that more intimate space. And by creating an online presence for your classroom, you can do this easily with your students because like I said, you can have 10 students go and do online work. You can have 10 students working on something from the textbook and then you can have those 10 students sitting there in front of you. So um, just being able to, I always said it was dividing and conquering. Um, and, and so just being able to divide those students up and be able to sit and talk to them closely, it was, it was such a great, time for me and it, it taught me so much about what they were understanding what they weren't getting all of that and then the last note is that and we all know this and now our parents know this and I think the rest of the world knows this but online learning is never going to replace our teachers but what it can do is it can help supplement your classroom work with more, um, you know, more engaging activities. And, and it can help you to meet your students' needs by, like I said up here, by, by personalizing and, and creating work that's there, that's just for them. Um, just to um, speak briefly on some similarities, just some big ones and, and some differences when you're talking about online, um, pedagogy and classroom management versus being in the classroom with those students. Uh, a lot of the foundation is exactly the same. If you know, a, a good classroom is going to have a lot of the same things as a good online classroom. It's, it's going to be an inviting, engaging environment. Um, teachers are going to be able to, to show their personality and, and, you know, be friendly and, and, and do things like that and, and you want to do that in the online environment too that for the same reason that we try to stand at the door and say hi to our kids when they're walking in uh, in an online environment you want to have a nice home page that says hey this is not scary this will be fun and look here I am here's your teacher and and um, here's a funny cartoon or a picture to make you giggle and so just bringing things like that in to make it a, a uh, more of a just a fun environment that that the students want to come into um, Students and I'm going to say this a lot during this uh, Presentation, but they need to create more than they consume and and what that means is so right now You're you're listening to me talk and and we're flipping through this slide deck. And so you're consuming you're just consuming and that you'll take this information and then go and create something with it, whether it be um, 
a, you know, a part of a Canvas course or a Google Classroom or anything. I'm, I'm just hoping that you will take all of this information and create with it. And that's what we need our students to do. Um, just like in the regular classroom, you have to set your rules, your norms, your class expectations. You have to set those early. That first week is something that you're really stressing over and over. And in the online realm, you have to do the same. You have to set those expectations early and you have to really explain them in depth. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but just all of those expectations have to be set early and the students really have to understand them. Um, you need to have a single landing point, which means, so in the classroom or in the school, you're room 124. So when somebody says, you have Miss P as a teacher, go to class, they know exactly where to go. Well, in the online realm, it has to be exactly the same. If somebody says, Miss P is your online teacher, you need to know, you need that one spot, kids need that one spot where they, need, they know to go to start doing any work that may be assigned to them. And I put a couple examples here. Canvas and Google Classroom are big ones, but there's also other resources like Symbaloo, which is just a free online um, source. And you, you can actually find it on the uh, free programs part of that website. But it's uh, if you don't have Canvas, if you don't have Google Classroom, you can have a Symbaloo and you can put links within Symbaloo for students to go and then start working out. And, but again, having that single point where everybody knows to go. So when, when somebody says, go online with Miss P's class, everybody knows the exact place to start. And that, that's really key. Uh, always teach the why, I already, I already talked about that. And then of course, just like in the classroom, these parents have to be your ally. If, if the parents are not seeing value in your online, the online portion of your teaching or of your class, they're not going to stress that their students do it. And so you have to have that, um, that value among um, that ally within with the parents. Um, and then some big differences are just um, the biggest one for me, really, especially as a high school teacher, and I know it's going to be the same for you guys as, um, as middle school teachers, you know, we're blessed in the sense of those kindergarten through third, fourth, fifth grade teachers, they did an amazing job at really explaining rules and explaining expectations. Like the kindergarten teacher um, taught these kids that when I say class starts at 8 a.m., that means you need to be in your seat at 8 a.m. You need to have your pencil. You need to have your book. You, you know, they teach all of that. And so by the time they get to us and we say, you better be in your seats by the time the bell rings at 7.45, the kids are like, they know. But in the online environment, when we say things, there's going to be a lot of things that the kids don't know. There has not been any previous introduction to this. And so we really have to, I put here, one of my best friends is a kindergarten teacher. And I put here, you know, we might need to go back and talk to some of our friends who teach those early grades, because in some aspects, and I'm going to show you in a moment, some, uh, some rules and things that go along with the Nice online courses. And I'll talk to you about how we really have to teach what that means. We can't just say, do this. We have to say it and we have to teach it because these kids are, it's completely new to these students. Um, when it comes to a classroom management perspective, one of the uh, best things that I learned uh, while I was in the classroom was that access online and access to technology is a privilege and it should always be held up as a privilege and the privilege can be taken away. Um, and, and this is key because I, I so I told you that I, I would have um, large classes. Well, one of my largest classes of 34 students was freshmen. It was freshman world geography. This was over a decade ago. Um, and I had a class of 34 students and I wanted to one day, I, I had this blended learning set up that I was so excited about. It had some kids on the internet, some kids in their book. And then, like I said earlier, some like 10 kids there in front of me just to talk. And I, my first two classes went wonderfully. Um, but then that last period class, 34 kids, they were done for the day. I don't know what was going on. Maybe it was a big football game that night or something. I don't know, but they were done. They were talking. Loud. 
that, you know, no matter how many times I said, sit down, be quiet, get to work, you know, hey, Steven, why are you not working? You know, it just wasn't working. And so after about 15 minutes, I just stood up and I said, close the laptops, put them in the laptop cart, everybody, fix your desk in a row, get your books out, and let's do this another way since you can't handle this. And I literally, I pulled up a PowerPoint and it was probably one of the most boring lectures I've ever given in my life on purpose. I'm not going to lie. And, but you know what? I, I never had trouble with that class again when we did this blended online learning. And what happened was I never even had to be the police anymore because these kids started policing themselves. And as you know, when you have a class full of kids, if they're, you know, if, if Johnny's over here snickering and laughing and being loud and they're the ones saying, be quiet, you're going to get us in trouble, you know, and you don't even have to, to speak up, then that's just, that's just the dream world. And, and that's what, that's what I got. And so, um, again, just always keep that in mind that this, this stuff that you're putting online to use in a blended classroom, it is, um, it's a privilege to be able to use it. And whether you take it away from just a few kids or you take it away from the entire class, it is an option and it's a great, it's a great tool to have in your back pocket. Um, and then finally, uh, you need to, uh, and this goes along with setting your expectations early up here, you need to introduce your online uh, instance early and you need to start slow too, because these kids, um, I hear as, as in, in my position as the online director, I have actually had people say to me, well, your job must be easy because these kids know everything there is to know about computers. No, these kids know everything they need to know about Fortnite and Twitter and Instagram. But when you say, oh, um, attach that Word document to an email and email it to me, you just lost 99% of them. And you just lost, I mean, I'm talking about students who are in my AP computer science class, online AP computer science. You know, these are some of the highest level students in schools throughout the, the state of Tennessee. And I have asked them before to upload something to an email and they, I mean, I could have said it, in Spanish and they wouldn't have understand understood me any better. So, um, you know, just basics like that. Again, you know, going back to, like I said, we've got to set it, the expectations, and then we've got to really teach it. And, and that's just one of those, um, that's just one of those examples. These kids are not used to working online in a professional type environment. And Brooke, uh, you know, interrupt me if you see any big questions that I could help with right then, because I will, um, I'll explain something more if I need to, or, um, you know, I did forget to say in the beginning, if you want to ask any kind of question, and we will hit those later, I'm going to make sure that I leave some time at the end to, um, to touch on any of your questions. So let's um let's start a, let's talk about classroom management online. Um, if you Google that, something that you're going to see is called netiquette, and it's it's etiquette on the internet. Netiquette, it's cute, right? That's hilarious. Um, anyway, all netiquette is is really just basic understanding of the rules that everybody should have before doing any kind of work online. And you can see here that I even put, you know, it's understanding of the rules that adults, many adults that we know still do not understand. Um, and, and we need to, as teachers, we have to make sure that our students are not going on, um, are not becoming adults, and and not understanding this kind of uh, netiquette or this kind of online uh, norms and and rules and things like that. So um, there's five big points, and I'm going to pull up this document in a moment. But online security, how to communicate, how to send professional emails, uh, online discussions, and um, notes with online video conferencing. And then the final part is academic integrity. It talks about plagiarism in the online world. 
And this one is the one for Nicewanger Online that we share with our students and that teachers cover with the, our students. Because again, our students, this is not just information that they have. You, you know, you don't know what you don't know. We have to teach our students this. Um, and then the note at the bottom is just, you know, by us teaching students of all ages how to how to work and communicate online, it, it's an it's a life skill. It's a life skill that they're going to need, and we need to start building that foundation early, so it does become a norm. It's just, yeah, you know, it's not something like, oh wow, that's weird. It's something like, yeah, duh, I knew that. I've I've known that since I was in the fifth grade, you know. And then with that said, all of these, to some sense, can be covered with kids K through 12. So I talk about online security and, and you think, oh my God, how are you gonna talk to a student about online security? I'm gonna get rid of some of these windows because my screen is, my internet is super slow and it's probably because I have a hundred things pulled up. Um, but you can talk to your kindergartner about internet security and about, different things, you know, when it comes to, if they have a computer in front of them and they're logging into it in any way, you should talk to them about that and how it is important for them to log in, but to also log out so nobody can access their information. So this uh, form here, you can also find it, like I said, on the website right here. You can click that and it will pull it up just like you see here. But something that I think could help all of you is to have like a piece to take away with you is if you go over here and click on file, you can click download and um, download that to a Word document. And then you can take this and you can turn it into something that could be one, a layout for yourself to always know, okay, these are things that I need to think about when my students start working online. Um, and then two, you can create um, a layout for your students to help them better understand all of this information. I'm not gonna read through everything. This is, this is longer. This is for high school students. It's three pages. One page may be more than enough for your students to, to cover just some of the really big um, areas of it. But um, I do want to talk about some big things and bring to the forefront just some things that we as teachers, uh, you know, when I first started at this job, I didn't even think of some of this. And this is just all things that have happened or have come up as I've been, you know, in this online program. But for one, um, we talk about passwords and if your school system gives very generic passwords and then asks students to change them, if the students don't change them, then kids can access their account. And we have had instances with Nicewanger Online where the school system gave them like a generic first name, last name, username, and then the password was like, change me one, two, three, and these kids never changed it, and somebody logged into their account. I remember one instance, someone logged into a, a girl's account, clicked on the midterm, and then X'd out of it, and just logged out. Well, because that midterm was clicked on, that immediately gave that girl a zero for a midterm grade. And so, I mean, of course we could go in, we could see that it was literally pulled up for two seconds and, and we could reset it so the girl could access it, but that would not have happened if she'd changed her password to something that couldn't be so easily guessed. Um, we also are always stressing to students that you need to, if you're using a shared computer at your school, you have to log out of your account. Don't just close the windows, don't just close the computer, the laptop up, but log out of everything and then close the windows and then turn the laptop off or close the laptop. Um, because again, if you don't log out and you, you know, the bell rings and you run to second period, third period comes in, opens up that computer and we've had kids who haven't even realized it and you know they open it up and they see their class and they're like oh cool and they just they don't think they start working and then boom 
they just realized after working for an hour that they were working within another student's class and they just submitted their work under another student's name. And so just things like that when it comes to security, um, kids just don't think about it. They don't know. And so we have to stress that to them. Um, I am, you know, the first two weeks of every semester in Nicewanger Online is me and all of our teachers saying, this is not Twitter, this is not a text message. You have to write in proper English. When you email me, I want complete sentences. Um, I want you does not equal you, you know, be professional. Um, and I think as classroom teachers, we can set the standards to help prepare these kids for online learning, either in high school or at the college level. We all know that they're going to have an online class at the college level. Um, when we, we stress to them that when they're reaching out to their teacher, you know, I have had students before who email me and say, hey, Gina, what's up? You know, and we need that to be more professional because it's not that I hate it when a kid calls me Gina, but it's I want to teach them how to, you know, have that mindset when they're communicating. Because one day, whether they go to college or they go straight to work um, somewhere, if they're emailing their boss, we want them to, to know and to always think, okay, I'm emailing my boss, so I'm going to use complete sentences here. And, and I'm going to call him by the title or name that I would normally call him if I was seeing him face to face and just, just different things like that. But the guidelines, they talk about slang. It, it talks about, um, you know, kids don't always understand. I think most do, but some kids don't understand that when you write something in caps, all caps, it means that you're yelling. I had a parent email me and it was in all caps and she wasn't like mad. Like her email was not angry. And then I was just like, seriously? But so, so this is something that they're not getting, uh, a lot of kids aren't even, they don't have, you know, someone at home who can teach them this either. Because again, like I said earlier, there's a whole lot of adults out there that don't understand these netiquettes. Um, we say here, be careful with sarcasm, sarcasm, but I tell my kids, don't be sarcastic online. You know, if you're doing an online discussion, and, and you write something and in your head, you're saying it sarcastically, but a whole lot of us, you know, we're not seeing that smirk on your face or um, we're not seeing your body language that's telling us that it's sarcasm. And we may think that you're being serious and think, holy cow, this guy's terrible, you know? And so, you know, just always we tell them, be careful with sarcasm. And then another thing when it comes to security, don't give out personal or confidential information. The emails kind of mirrors the other communications, but we do talk a little bit more specific about giving a subject line. Um, we tell students that they always need to sign their name. Uh, it looks more professional, it looks more respectful, but then also, you know, you have kids who, this is their email address. Like, how am I supposed to know who that's from if they just put, hey, Miss P, I'm having trouble with module one, blah, blah, blah. Can you please help explain this? Like it could be the most beautiful email and I've gotten these before, but then they don't write their name at the end. And I just see this in the, in the email as from the personal email. And I'm like, wow, I wish I knew who it was. Um, but again, the kids don't think of this and they, and they need to be told this. Um, they also need to be told that, you know, everybody can see your email address. There's a whole lot of parents out there that need to be reminded that, you know, some of these email addresses are not, they're not okay. So maybe you want to change to something else. Um, talks about when to hit reply all and when to just hit, you know, just to reply to the person. Uh, more information on forwarding emails. Uh, the biggie, always proofread before you hit send. Um, so again, just some, some norms that we, we do every day, but they're not going to be used to. Online discussions. Uh, you know, the biggest one is the first one, and that's when you hit submit in an online discussion, the entire class can now see your response. And so you need to just always keep that in mind. You need to proofread. Um, it, it goes into some more things that kids might not think about. Um, one of the big ones is, you know, if, if, if you have a discussion in your online class where kids can just ask each other questions, don't answer that question unless you really 
really know that you know the answer. Like just guessing to try to answer can actually do more harm than good. Or if you are just guessing, make sure that you tell, that you put in there, I don't know for sure, but this is what I'm thinking, you know, something like that, because it, it can really, um, it can really mess somebody up. Again, proofread. The online video conferencing, this is something as a teacher you guys should check out because um, all of these came from lessons learned from doing online video conferencing, from us doing online video conferencing. And we're learning a lot of this as we go right now and as teachers are doing more Zoom meetings and things. But you know, the, the first one, if you're not talking, be on mute. Um, this is a big one for even adults too. We've all seen funny videos of where somebody had something weird in the background, you know, but before you activate your camera, look around you, you know, how are you dressed? How's your mamaw dressed who's sitting on the couch? With you? That, that's a big question. That's a question I would have had to ask when I was, if I was doing this, uh, when I was in high school, where are your pets? If you have a dog who barks at the drop of a hat, let's get that dog somewhere else so it doesn't so when you're being when you're speaking within the class it doesn't start barking and and just being a huge distraction um it talks about the chat box here as as a teacher you need to really understand that chat box you need to understand that you can turn that chat box off and oftentimes that may be what you need to do because my my twins were in the third grade this past year and I never told them anything about the chat box in Zoom. And the very first time my son Nico had a Zoom meeting with his teacher, I went in there and looked and the teacher was talking away and he was chatting on the side with his best friend about Fortnite. So you, you want to make sure that you understand all of those things and how you can avoid them being a distraction. Um, I talked to them about what to do when they are called on. Um, you want to stress to them to, if the meeting is at 10, don't start trying to log in at 9.59 because if something goes wrong, you don't have time to troubleshoot and you're going to be going into the meeting late. So we tell them, try to log in five to 10 minutes before. And if you're new to the program, log in way before or log in the day before and and just check it out look at it figure out how do if i want to ask a question in a chat box how do i do that if i want to raise my hand which is an option in, in in different programs you know how do i do that and so just making yourself as a teacher and then also as a student making yourself more comfortable is um it's just going to benefit everybody in those um in those environments and then finally, the academic integrity, plagiarism. Um, you can read through this, and this is just a little briefing of, we have a full-on plagiarism policy. Students have to read that policy and take a test on it, and they have to make 100 on that test until they can, uh, and before they can do any work within their class. Like their course will not open up to, for them until they take a test on our full policy and, and what that means. Um, the biggest thing, and, and it's written right here, is in the online environment, especially fully online, if we're doing remote learning again in, in the fall, um, trust is everything and kids have to understand that. And for me, as soon as a student has one sentence that is copied and pasted, I, can, I no longer trust that student. And, and every, everything that is submitted after that, I am checking and double checking for plagiarism like I'm going above and beyond to check. So um, also in our platform, and, and this may be, you know, this is school level, probably even system level things for, for you guys, but within our platform, plagiarism is a deal breaker. After you, after you there are three instances of plagiarized work, you're um, completely dropped from the class. So uh, those are just things to kind of keep in mind. And if, you're, if you are kind of doing your own little, uh, plagiarism policy of what is it what does it mean again this is something you have to explain to the kids because they they don't see anything wrong with googling it and then just copying and pasting that somewhere else they oftentimes think what I thought that's how this worked you have to explain it to them you have to teach it to them um, and some big things that also have to be that they need to think of is that um, they need to safeguard their own work. So just like above in that security section, when I tell them you have to log out of your account 
so other people can't access your work. They, you know, this is reminding them you have to safeguard your own work so that other students can't find it and take it and submit it as their own. And then another big one, because that's going to be the first excuse that you get when you call a student out on plagiarism is, is oh, I didn't know. Well, we say over and over, whether it is accidental or purposeful, it's still plagiarism. And in college, you get kicked out of the class immediately and, and or you fail the class immediately, you know, so there's some really huge consequences. So you, you have to understand this. Um, so this is my, and then I also kind of modeled because we talk about plagiarism, we're talking about things like that. I, some of this, the first, uh, the general guides to communication section and the email section, I adapted from a website where I found the University of Florida, there, um, they have a website for uh, um, Center for Teaching Excellence, and it talked about that, and I adapted that from there. So I even put that on here to, um, to show the students that you know this it's, it's this easy if you're going somewhere else and you're getting information don't just pass it off as your own don't just pretend like oh i thought of this all by myself and even if you reword everything which i reworded a lot i'm still wanting to give other website credit so again netiquettes this is our form uh like i said if you want to click on file and download it um please do so and then change it and just turn it into something that you can use with your own students and that also that you can use to just kind of think through your own kind of expectations and rules that you want to create for your classroom. And let me show you on the resource website at the very bottom, we also have, so that was huge, right? That was a big three page thing. We also have created with Nicewander Online, a very short, you know, just infographic that is showing, actually I'm pulling up a new page again, it's getting very slow, here it is, um, that is showing um, just kind of a summary of what our entire netiquette uh, document covers. But you can see, you know, be scholarly, be respectful, be professional, be polite. And so we, we just kind of, took all of this these three pages and turned it into something like this that we can we can embed this picture into our online classes and and make it an easy kind of learning tool or even just like a, a reminder for our students so let's move on and talk for a moment about just some pedagogy ideas within the online environment um, First thing I want to say, and I'm going to say over and over, is that students must create more than they can consume. I've already said that once. I just, that needs to be just always in the back of your mind. And the online environment is a great place for them to do this because they have everything here now. So it's not like they're in a textbook and they're now, okay, close your textbooks and now let's get out our computer and let's log in here and let's do this. You know, in the online environment that you're creating, it's all going to already be there. And I'm going to show you in a moment some, um, some things that, that go on within our environment, our online, not swanger online, and, and talk to you about how it's just an easy place to put everything the students need and then just let them take all of that information and create what they want to create with it. Um, I talked about home pages are crucial. You've got to be, have that inviting space because no matter the age of your students, this is going to be new for them. This is going to be a little scary. They're not going to say this is scary, but this is going to be a little scary. And, and you, don't, you don't want to turn them off from your course as soon as they log in. Um, what's your why? Always your why. Uh, chunk information into small pieces. We do this in the classroom anyway, but sometimes it teachers will tend to... Um, put a whole bunch of information on one page within a class and they'll say, okay, this is everything that covers how to, that covers this standard, for example. And it's just huge. And, and as an adult, I look at it and I'm like, oh, I don't want to read that, you know? And so, you know, these, these little teenagers and these uh, 12 year olds, they don't want to read it. And so chunk, chunk information into smaller pages, chunk your information like videos and things into smaller, shorter videos. And I'm going to show you an example of that in, in, a, in a minute. Again, talk to those early elementary teachers 
about, you know, if you are having trouble explaining something, uh, and it's not that they're going to be able to explain it for you, but they're going to be able to talk to you about how they explain things to their children who are completely clueless when they come in. Feedback is so important. That's online and classroom. Um, and, and things that I say all the time, a test score is not feedback. A 100 on a project is not feedback. If a student makes 100 on a project, that student should get a, either verbal feedback or written feedback as to why they made 100. You know, this is excellent. Your layout was wonderful, easy to read. You've met every, um, everything that would needed to be covered in the rubric. You know, tell them why they made 100 so they can then know what to duplicate in the future. And then, of course, anything less than 100, they need feedback on the why. Why? What did I miss? What did I do wrong? Um, you should always teach technology as a learning tool and not just a gaming tool. You may have a, a link in your class that sends kids out to, to a website. I know there's like some fun math websites that my students, my, not my students, my kids use that um, they do games and they do like race games and they have to answer math questions in between the games to get their car to go faster. And it's super cool and I really like it, but that can't be the only thing that you have online because we're trying to move them from that thought of just, this is for games, you know? This needs to be above all, it needs to be a learning tool. When, when you have the internet, you have a world of knowledge at your, literally, and we need to teach them how to find that information, what's good information, what's not good information, et cetera. Um, even though your students are in the classroom, please have them do online discussions, have them submit their work online, because all that's going to do is give them those valuable life skills. And then um, you as a teacher, you need to model things. So when something isn't working, and they see you troubleshooting how to fix it, and you're in front of them, and, and the screen is up, and you're saying, oh no, the flash on this website's doing something weird. Um, and, and you tell the kids, okay, let's, let's try to fix this, guys. Let's look at this. You know, when they see you troubleshoot, then they learn a lot from that. Um, and they also learn a lot when they see you uh, get a little frustrated, and we all do that. You know, there's gonna be a day when your kids are going to be in there and you're going to have them divided up into groups and you're going to say, you guys go to my web page and click that link and, and go there and, and do this. And the kids are all going to click that link and start going, it's not working. It says the link is broken. Da, da, da. You know, it's probably going to be the day that you have a drop in from one of your principals, but you've got to let them know it's okay to get frustrated, but we've got to fix it. We can't just give up. We've got to keep moving forward. So let me um, show you, this is just a list, and this is basically just things that I um, just spoke about. But what I want to do is show you some examples of um, some teaching strategies from some of our online classes, and even from uh, some videos from some of our online teachers. So first off, the why, I keep saying why, create pages within your class that give the students the why and and you know make them silly make them funny but make them to where they understand this is why i'm doing this and and if you have a minute you have to read that it cracks me up he says i can't think of things i don't want and he talks about a robot dog and night vision goggles and and things like that and what it's showing the kids is that we're all this way but we have to get past that and we have to better understand our paychecks, our taxes, and how to create a budget. And that's what we're doing in this, in this unit, in this chapter. And, you know, and I have the standards, which mean nothing to the students, but I have them there. So if anybody wants to say, what standards are you covering? They're there. But I also have just a fun way to show them this is why we're doing this. Um, another thing that I stress within this is that, um, your prompts are key. Essay prompts, project prompts, just small questions that you ask. You really have to think about them in an online environment because like I said, they have a world of information um, at their disposal and they can easily, if, if number one here just said, 
why is money better than the barter system? All a student has to do is go to Google and click why is money better than the barter system? And they just, they can copy and paste it and they can get in trouble or they can reword it a little bit and try to put it into their own words. But anyway, it, it's not really making them think deeply about it like we want them to. And so when you ask questions that prompt them to give additional examples or to give, this is a big one, put an, give an example of how this affects your own life, then that really cuts down on their ability to plagiarize and just turn in something that's copied and pasted because they then need to put it and give an example within their own life. Um, you know, the fourth one here says, what was the gold standard? Again, they could just Google that, but I asked them, are you worried that we're no longer on it? And that part of the question tells me more about whether they understand what the gold standard is um, or not a thousand times better than just the first part. Like I sometimes don't even read the first um, sentence when they're answering number four, because I'll, I know, you know, I, I kind of glance and I say, okay, yeah. Um, but then this second part, this is what tells me if they really understand it or not. So when you're thinking of prompts for anything from the smallest of questions, and this is, they watch this video and answer these questions, but from the smallest of questions to big essay prompts, the more you can tie it in and the more you can uh, make it to where it's something that they have to explain thoroughly and give their own examples that possibly, you know, pertain to their own lives, then the better um, of an assignment it's going to be. And then finally, I say here, um, and, and you guys can look through these. Yeah, I don't want to read through all of them right now, but um, I, I say that sometimes you should let them choose a program for the presentation. So you may have a project and you want the kids to present on something. They use whatever you want. You know, find a program that you like and use it. But then sometimes you should mandate that they use a certain program because then they will learn a new program. And while learning that new program, they will learn how to deal with being frustrated because they don't know what to do in the beginning. They will learn how to possibly, you know, create a free account with something. Um, and I'll show you this here. Uh, this is a US history class. And, and it's a, a timeline project, a timeline to the Great War and the students have to take all of these dates, all of these things that happen, and they have to turn it into a timeline. Now I could open that up and they use, you know, they use PowerPoint or they use Google Slides or they'll use you know, anything. But instead I tell them for this project, you must use Prezi. And I tell them that, but then I also, I create videos and I embed videos. This is 33 seconds and it shows them how to click here, click here, click here, put in your email, boom, you're done. So, and this is, um, this was created with Screencast-O-Matic. Um, and I was telling you, you know, as a teacher who has any kind of online presence, you need some kind of screen recording video. Well, this is an example okay, of guys, that screen to get recording a free video. Account with Prezi, you're going to go to Prezi.com. So, as you can see, I just talked through it. But then again, so I could created, I could have created one. 10 or 15 minute video that goes from here all the way to when you're done, this is how you submit it. But I didn't, I chunked it, I divided it up. So I did a short one here, it says here's how you get this. And then I said, once you have in this video, once you have your account, click here. And this shows you how to get a template for a timeline within Prezi. And then it shows you how to pull uh, information boxes in and they have to do a box with text information for every event and they have to do a picture. I, I show them how to pull all of that information in. And then finally, in this video, I show them how to get a good link, how to get a good link to their Prezi and how to submit that link to me. So I've chunked it up into pieces just to make it something that they can um, navigate through easily and something that doesn't seem so overwhelming. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to show you, no, two more things. I'm sorry. And I know we're running out of time. Uh, and I say here, every kid I know, they, they don't want to be a movie star. They want to be a YouTuber. And, and there's so many ways 
that you can let these kids have this ability within your class. You can use, you can have a free screencast account like that. If, if you have Canvas, there are ways that students can do uh, videos within Canvas and submit those videos as assignments. If you have um, Flipgrid, if your school system has Flipgrid. So just a ton of different ways. And then I also kind of highlighted some different things that students can create. And I put, you know, in that U.S. history class, students write, there's two poems. There are two projects where students write poems. So it's not just for ELA. Um, there's projects where students just record their voice and, and maybe they're talking about something they've learned or, or an issue or, or something like that. You can have them create political cartoons or memes. And so just a ton of ways to have students create. But um, I wanted to show you, this is from a great friend of mine, Scott Lamey who uh, teaches online math and uh, he teaches for Bristol City um, but he has as a math teacher a lot of um, times it's really hard to think of okay well I teach math how am I supposed to do you know why would kids ever make a video for me and and he kind of talks about a couple of ways to um, use presentations as an assessment really so you can see here that really thought about it and how to present information in a way that was meaningful for her. Let's see if it was okay, so on okay. to the last okay, so yeah. on to the last you too, four right. problems. So the first problem we're gonna work on now is number four. Complete the square for the So this girl is um she's using screencast o -Matic. That's that free program I just told you about. And what she's doing, he gave them, I think, um, when I watched the whole video, it was something like seven questions. So it wasn't a huge amount of work, but he gave them seven questions and they had to answer those questions. But then on their own, they had to, in any format they wanted to, they had to explain how they got their answers. And so she created a video like this that where she's going through each question and she's explaining how she got her answer. She's pulled up this screen over here where she can show graphs and things. There's one um, at the beginning. This one was really neat. So this is, he tells us this is a student who is, um, she's a cartoonist and she created this character. And so she made this character and then just put, three, the answer would be C. I subtracted three from the exponent, blah, blah, blah. And so she thoroughly explained what she needed to explain, how she got her answers. But again, did it in a completely different way from the other girl, but both ways were just exceptional. And, and all it did by making them do a smaller amount of questions, but then just putting it here and then having to explain themselves, it made them think about it a lot more. And then the last one I wanna show you, is this is just not this is not just for older kids so um this is my favorite planet is Mark. so this is my my little one yes he is that precious uh this is nico uh my twin one of my twins um who back in the spring his teachers asked them when school was out do a presentation on your favorite planet and and they left it wide open do it however you want you know blah 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 well he created a slide deck in Google, which I helped him with, and the color of Mars and then and I pulled up the Screencast-O-Matic, and I showed him, click here to record, click here to pause, click here if you mess up and you want to start over. And I came back about 30 minutes later, and he created this video, this one-minute video. So this is not just for older kids. So, and you're, uh, of course, our, our middle school age students can do it. Um, okay, I want to see if there's any questions, but please, I beg you, um, take a look at these slides. I do have some additional slides that um, just with information and links that I knew I wouldn't have time to get to, but I wanted you to, um, to have those there to look at at a later date. Um, so here's the evaluation and certificate slide. Brooke, if you want to tell them about that. Yes, thank you so much, Gina. Um, so I posted the link to the evaluation in the, the chat box. You should be able to click on that there or go through um, the slide deck if you have that open. So we'd appreciate it if you just took a minute 
um, to fill to complete the survey and that's going to allow us to reflect on your thoughts about the session. We're always looking for ways to improve and collect your information if you'd like to receive a certificate of attendance. So it's very important that you go ahead and do that now, especially if you're looking for that certificate so that you can get credit for attending the session. Um, and if anyone has problems with that, just reach out and we'll be glad to help you. And Gina, we appreciate you so much and I've learned, uh, really learned a lot. And I know that if people have questions, I'm sure that, and I know you've said this before, so I hope you don't mind me yes, speaking for great. you, but um, just reach out to, to you with wow. any questions and take a look at the, the website and all of the great resources that you've provided for them. Yeah, and, and I really hope that those are those resources are something that, that can help you. But yeah, like Brooke said, email me anytime. I, I've already been getting emails from my first two presentations and they've been great questions that have prompted me to create more videos to help you guys with different questions. And so it's just, you guys are helping me probably more than I'm helping you. So please keep asking. Well, um, thank you so much. It looks like our time is up. So um, like we said, just please go ahead and complete the survey and reach out if you have any questions. Thanks everyone for joining us today.